Welcome to the People's Health Briefing, a component of the Trusted Voices Campaign. I'm Dr. Noha Balada from Reeds Community Health Center, reporting for the week of August 21st, 2023. After a COVID status update, including about a new variant we're tracking, I'll talk about which arm to get your booster in. As health professionals root in Oakland, serving some of the people most vulnerable to getting and suffering from COVID-19, we're here to cut through the noise to give you information you can use to make choices that will keep you, your loved ones, and your community as safe as possible. The goal of the People's Health Briefing is to empower you with our best knowledge and thinking every Tuesday morning. The best indicators we seem to have at this point on where we are in the pandemic are wastewater, percent test positivity, emergency department visits, hospitalization and death, and kind of in that order from earlier to later indicators. And we're mostly these days looking at the nation overall because it's getting more difficult in smaller geographies to really get a sense of what's going on. Taking a look at wastewater, this graph shows the percentage of wastewater sites across the United States that have increases, that's in orange, and large increases in red. These data are through August 15th with the caveat that the two weeks before that, that's the shaded area, are still incomplete. And we can see that we did hit a dip early in June, but since then, those orange and red areas representing the percent of sites with increases are on the rise. And the percent of sites that are decreasing, which are those in the blue, you can see are, that area is getting smaller. I'll point out that this is one area where reporting is improving. Since about April, we've had approximately 1,300 wastewater sites across the country reporting into this data set. This time last year, there were only about 800 sites reporting. So I do hope that we'll continue to see improved coverage of wastewater sites across the country. And if this is something you're interested in knowing about, if you have a wastewater site reporting in your area or maybe an area that you might be traveling to, this would be something worth taking a look at and I put a few resources for this in the post. Now taking a look at test percent positivity across the nation. As a whole, we're continuing to head straight up. So we're now at 12.2% positivity as of August 12th, and that's up from 10.7% the week before. And here we also had hit a nice dip early in June or so, when we were just above 4% positivity. So we are triple that at this point. We're still in the range of about 30 to 40,000 tests per week. So that's what this is representing here. And we've been there for the last couple of months or so. So this is not a huge number of tests, but that number has been fairly stable for the past couple of months. So without any big change in testing behavior, the direction of this graph is helpful. And obviously what it is telling us right now is that things are headed up. Now taking a look at emergency department visits, and this is the percentage of all emergency department visits with diagnosed COVID-19 in the United States. And we can see that the upslope continues. This metric continues to be the most updated out of all of them, with this graph reflecting a seven-day moving average as of August 18th, so just a few days old. And unfortunately, this is continuing to increase without any signs of leveling off. And now taking a look at hospital admissions, once again, we were coming down nicely. We were down in the range of 6,000 hospitalizations per week, which was still a lot, but it was down to 6,000 hospitalizations per week for most of June. But early in July, that trajectory reversed itself. And now we are unfortunately over 12,000 hospitalizations for the week ending August 12th. And that's up from around 10,000 the week before. So this is people who are sick enough to be in the hospital with at least symptoms that indicate the need for a COVID test, so hospitalizations with or for COVID are currently double what they were for much of June, definitely headed significantly in the wrong direction. And for the last several weeks, actually, not only has the number of hospitalizations been increasing, but now the rate of that increase is rising as well. 
meaning that we're heading into steeper increases week over week. So the week ending August 12th saw a 21.6% increase, and that's up from a 14.3% increase the week before. And now what about deaths? Deaths had been decreasing every single week since late February. And at that point, we were around 2,000 deaths per week. It's been going down. It had been going down weekly since then. But unfortunately, the week ending August 5th, that trend reversed. And we are now showing an increase for the second week in a row with an 8.3% increase the week ending August 12th. And remember, when it comes to deaths, this is probably one of the most reliable metrics we have. If COVID shows up on the death certificate, it means that COVID was either the underlying cause of death, which has been the case 87% of the time, or a contributing cause of death, which was the other 13% of the time. But either way, we can be sure that COVID did not help. And remember that increased deaths have followed increases in hospitalizations by several weeks for almost the duration of the entire pandemic. So we should be prepared to see this continue to increase trailing behind those troubling increases in hospitalizations. So to recap, we have increases in wastewater indicating SARS-CoV-2 is circulating in our environment. We have increased test positivity rates that indicates that people are getting COVID, which we know is gonna result in being sick, missing school or work, and some percentage of people ending up with long COVID or post COVID events. But we're not just seeing virus circulating and positive tests, we're seeing increased emergency department visits and hospitalizations and now deaths. And as a reminder, there's no more routine COVID screening happening at the hospital. So these tests are really only occurring in the event that there is some symptom that would lead to getting the test done. And even that, it may not be getting done every time. So with all these indicators taken together, we can see that we are having a summer increase or surge or spike or whatever you want to call it. And I'll remind us that we did not predict this. And I and others have been warning that there were signs of this coming after we started to notice them. That was about five or six weeks ago. But no one said six months ago or even three months ago that they expected an August surge. So that's just a reminder for us to stay humble and realize that we are still chasing behind SARS-CoV-2. It is not seasonal. We still really don't know what's next. And speaking of not knowing what's next, let's take a look at variants. EG5, which is one of the XBB family, it's XBB.1.9.2.5, continues to increase. It's forecasted now at about 21%. We continue dealing with almost all XBB subvariants of Omicron at this time. But most recently, we've become aware of a new variant, and that's BA.2.86, which is not in the XBB family. It actually is a descendant of BA.2, but it does have some features that are causing us to take note. This is the risk assessment from the UK Health Security Agency that I refer here from time to time because they provide these variant uh, technical assessments, which are very helpful. And this assesses the BA.2.86 variant in some detail. The link is in the post. So this variant was first identified on August 13th in Israel, so about a week ago. And since then, five more cases have been identified, three in Denmark, one in the UK and one here in the US in Michigan. So you might wonder why are we getting concerned? There's only been six identified cases. So I'll walk through why this is concerning. So first off is the number of mutations. So this variant is, like I said, likely derived from BA2, but it has a large number of mutations that make it very different from BA2 and also make it very different from the XBBs that we were just talking about there are 34 mutations on the spike protein compared to its ancestor BA2. And of course, the spike protein is how SARS-CoV-2 enters our cells. And it's also the part of SARS-CoV-2 that so far we've been developing our vaccines against. So we're concerned about this variant, not only getting around immunity we might have from prior vaccines or infection, but we may also be concerned that if this takes off, will the boosters we have coming this fall be a great match? This remains to be seen. 
So once again, we've only identified six cases, so we're not there yet, but there are other reasons for concern. The six cases, even the three that were in Denmark, are not related to each other. And this variant was identified in individuals who didn't have any recent travel. So this all seems to indicate that BA.2.86 has already spread around the world. The World Health Organization has designated BA.2.86 as a variant under monitoring. So we expect that there will be more details soon. And the details we're looking for are whether this strain will get around our prior immunity, whether it's similar enough to the XBBs that we should expect good coverage from the boosters that are coming out in the fall or not. We're really just going to have to keep an eye out to see if it has an advantage over the XBB circulating around now, whether it's going to outcompete, so to speak, those XBBs. It is completely possible that it will just kind of die off, but it's also possible that it could cause us some trouble if it starts to increase. If it starts to increase, then we'll also have questions like, does this variant make people sicker? Is it more contagious? Do our treatments work? And so on. So it's too early to draw conclusions, but I do think this is an important reminder for us that SARS-CoV-2 continues to evolve and that we need to continue using our technology like sequencing and not only sequencing of specimens from patients, but also our wastewater. This would give us a better idea and an earlier idea, ideally. And we'd like to have a more comprehensive idea of what's going on when we recognize new variants like this before they become a big problem. So we expect to have more information on this in the next week or two, but I will point out that this is a bit reminiscent of how Omicron came on the scene, where the same sequence showed up in multiple different countries at the same time. And next thing you know, we have a humongous surge. So I wouldn't necessarily expect anything as big as that, just because we're in a different place with more people having established prior immunity but it will still depend on how contagious it is and how much it evades that prior immunity, which we really do not know yet. So there's certainly no need to panic, but there's also no need to be complacent. We remain in an evolving situation, so it is a good idea to stay prepared. And lastly, I wanted to briefly cover this article that came out on August 11th, published in The Lancet. The study is out of Germany, where they looked at 303 people who received the Pfizer vaccine in 2021. None of these participants had prior COVID-19 before the vaccination. 147 of them received their second vaccine dose in the same arm as the first, and 156 got the second shot in the opposite arm as the first. And they looked at antibody levels a couple of weeks after the second dose. And in a subset of the participants, they also looked at different T cell responses. So remember, that's the cellular response or kind of that second line of defense that comes up later, but also protects us against more severe disease. And it turned out that whether the participant got the vaccine on the same side or the opposite side, there was overall a strong immune response. And overall, the vaccines were similarly well tolerated, with the main complaints being sore arm and fatigue. But the most interesting finding was that neutralizing antibodies specifically against the spike protein were significantly lower after vaccination on the opposite side compared to those who got it on the same side. And there were also some T cell responses that were lower in those that were vaccinated on the opposite side compared to those vaccinated on the same side. So lower neutralizing antibody activity means less protection against infection with SARS-CoV-2 and lower T cell responses may mean less protection from severe COVID-19 disease. So this data suggests that getting the vaccine on the same side with subsequent doses gives you better neutralizing antibodies, so more protection against getting COVID and a better T cell response, so better long lasting protection from more severe disease. So this supports getting boosters in the same arm as your original vaccine. There needs to be more studies on this, but the theory is that the immune response might be better in the same arm due to booster vaccine drainage by the same set of lymph nodes that 
had to process it the first time when you were primed with the original vaccine. So same side for now, that's the best information that we have. There actually has not been a lot of study on this. And so this is the most comprehensive uh, and really the only study that I've seen uh, specifically looking at this for, for COVID vaccines for both antibody response and T cell response. So in summary, all indications are pointing to an increase in COVID affecting us now, wastewater, percent positivity, emergency department visits, hospitalization, and now death are all heading up. We also have a new variant we're keeping an eye on, nothing to panic about, but a good reminder that we remain in an evolving situation, so we should stay prepared. We are expecting boosters in the fall, and based on this most recent study, it may be advisable to get it in the same arm where you got your primary series. In the meantime, please do what you can to avoid infection and reinfection and spreading it to others. And this is getting more difficult as people seem to be choosing to drop some of the protection measures, even though COVID is still very much with us and increasing. Dropping precautions at this time is not advisable when there seem to be cumulative effects of repeat infection. There doesn't seem to be any limit to the number of times you can catch COVID and certainly SARS-CoV-2 is circulating more in our environment at this time. What we do know is that following COVID, we are seeing increased risk of a number of things, including diabetes, blood clots, heart attacks, stroke, memory issues, neurological issues, not in everyone, but we still can't predict who, we can't seem to prevent it or to head it off other than not getting COVID. We also know that if you caught COVID once and did fine, that is not a guarantee about the next time. Some repeat infections can be more severe, even in the acute phase, and every infection is a new opportunity, maybe even a compounded opportunity for long COVID and post-COVID impacts. So let's keep up our best practices to prevent the spread of COVID and prevent outbreaks. Stay up to date on your vaccinations, Wear a high quality filtration mask like N95, KN95, or KF94, especially indoors with others. If you're going to be indoors, you wanna make sure that you have good ventilation and filtration, which you can assess with, C with a CO2 monitor. Limit your time mixing indoors with members of the public, especially whenever possible, gather outdoors. If you're someone who should be treated if you catch COVID, then you should know this in advance. You should have a treatment plan. Treatment can reduce the risk of hospitalization or death by about 80% if you start it on time. And still losing about 2,000 people from, per month and now increasing to SARS-CoV-2 just in the U.S. alone. So it's definitely not done with us yet. Starting treatment on time means testing on time, so know where you can get tested. If you don't feel well, please stay home and rest. Don't spread what you've got to others. If you're positive for COVID, please test negative before you go back around others. In general, enough virus to detect is enough to infect. If you don't have a primary care physician, please get one. Know how to reach them before you need them. Remember to eat a balanced diet, incorporate vegetables, avoid sugary drinks, consider a multivitamin supplement, get some regular physical activity unless you're sick. In that case, please get your rest. Check your blood pressure, get your baseline labs checked like sugar, cholesterol, vitamin D, kidneys, liver function, manage your stress levels and get a good night's sleep. This concludes today's People's Health Briefing. Thank you so much for joining us and we'll see you again next time.